uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about the centipede game um, and the role of commitment. So I have, uh, again, um, uh, the four ingredients of a game. Two players, player A and player B, they move sequentially. Uh, each player has only two available actions, capital D and capital R for player A, and small d and small r for player B. And what do they know? Player A moves first, she knows nothing because that's the beginning of the game. And then remember, that's the timeline, the game tree. So player A moves first, chooses either D or R, the capital D or R. If she chooses D, the game is over. Well, if she chooses R, um, the payoffs gets enlarged in a sense. Player B observes, obviously, I mean, she knows that uh, player A did not finish the game, but instead uh, she allowed the payoff to enlarge or increase. And so player B has the option of choosing uh, D or R, meaning, you know, ending the game or continue. Uh, if she chooses to continue, player A again moves, so she observes that, and she can end the game now, or she can uh, continue. And finally, player B observes all the moves. Obviously, it means nobody ended the game. And so player B now has, well, whatever she chooses, she's going to end the game anyway. But one option is going to bring a, a different payoff than the other. So if you look at the payoffs, player A is the first mover. So the first number always belongs to player A, all right? I mean, um, you, you may like to, uh, you may want to write this as A, B, A, B, A, B, just to make sure that you keep track of which payoff belongs to which player, all right? So the first player is A, therefore the first payoff must belong to the first, um, uh, first mover which is A, all right? So what happens is in this game, if player A ends the game at the very beginning of the game, um, she's gonna get payoff one and player two, the B I mean, is gonna get nothing. If she however continues, what happens is that the payoffs could increase as large as three and three for each or even, well, two, four. Well. The, the sum of the payoffs is getting larger. Rather than one, the sum of the payoffs, now the sum of the payoffs is six, all right? Well, what happens is that once player A moves and, and continues the game, um, even though player B ends the game, the, the, the total payoff will be larger, but the thing is, if any player ends the game earlier than um, you know, the original ending, that's sort of the original ending or end of the game. So if any player ends the game before the end of the game, well, um, the ending player, the player who ends the game is gonna get more of a benefit, all right? So for example, here the total surplus, the total payoff is two, but only B uh, who is ending the game is getting the whole surplus. If the game moves on to the third stage, so first stage, second stage, third stage, and the final stage, fourth stage, you can think it that way. So if the player A ends the game, well, this time the total payoff is four, but player A gets a larger portion of, not all, but a larger portion of that. If uh, she moves on to the final stage, well, in any case, the, payoff, the total payoff increases more than four, and it increases to six. Uh, but if, if player B ends it in this way by choosing uh, D, uh, she's going to get the bigger portion. If she chooses R, she's going to get uh, three. Uh, she's going to basically split the surplus half and half. So both players actually benefit by ending the game um, and at, at, at the final stage rather than at the initial stage. You see? So the question is... Um, is this ever gonna be, or this, but obviously this is more appealing because it's also the fair way of dividing the total available surplus. The question is, will they ever reach or get this outcome? Um, so basically uh, we can apply the backward induction solution to this game and see if they can. 
But don't forget, the backward induction makes sense when both players are rational and both players are um, selfish in the sense that they're trying to maximize their own payoff. And obviously, um, we never mentioned about this before, but this is exactly a good example to discuss that, the commitment, all right? The players are lacking any commitment. So they have commitment issues, okay? And, and in real life, you probably have observed that, at least in movies, I happen to see a lot like the man or the woman has a commitment issues and so they, they can't get married. You know, the classic Hollywood uh, sort of movie uh, cliche. So yes, commitment is a serious issue for many people. And in this game, the commitment is a serious problem. So what does that mean, commitment? So ending up the payoff three and three means they have to commit of choosing R and small r, right? So player A should always be choosing R, player B should always be choosing small r. So that's a commitment. It's like, we there's a path that's gonna take us to the pay of three, three, and we have to commit that we're gonna follow that path. Well, the problem is, the commitment is, 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 is problem, is, is difficult because there are sins that's gonna attract our attention along the way along this path. So what is this sin, for example? Well, so here, player A, for example, um, she knows if she commits, if she follows her commitment, she's going to get a payoff of three and her opponent is going to get a payoff of three. But you know what? If she chooses, um, for example, uh, D, she will also get the same payoff now. It's like, why not end the game immediately right now, for example? Or for instance, uh, player B, um, well, well let's, let's not talk about that. So here, for example, the commitment uh, is not that um, sort of uh, uh, vocal um, or sort of uh, highlighted maybe because A already knows that she's going to get payoff A if she ends now. So it seems like it's a rational thing to commit. All right. Um, so therefore, it seems like um, maybe at one point the commitment, I mean, there is a sin which may sort of attract attention, but there's another sin which is here. It's like at the end of this, I mean, not at the end, and in, in the final stage, when player B makes the choice, so they can't really commit, I mean, the player B committing for R is expecting too much because there's a huge sin for her waiting there, which is gonna attract her attention, which is playing D basically. Why is that? Well, because if she, if player B chooses R, she's gonna get payoff of three, but instead if she chooses D, she's gonna get payoff of four. Uh, well, is she gonna feel bad about it? Well, that's the thing. Uh, there, if feeling bad, is, is, is a val, sort of a valid reason uh, for decision making, well then those payoffs should incorporate those feelings into. That's what we assume, okay? So be, 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 uh, be, be careful about that. And, and there is no game afterwards. I mean, these, these guys are basically playing the game, receives their payoffs, and they never ever see each other. They never ever communicate with each other. They never ever feel guilty about what they have done. So imagine they play the game, uh, sort of consume the payoffs, you know, enjoy the payoffs and then die. Uh, let's think it that way. And there's no, you know, hell heaven kind of thing. Uh, so there's no future. So when I say there's no future, it's really hard to uh, sometimes um, uh, imagine maybe. Um, so in that scenario, player B has a very strong motivation of to go for D rather than for R. So then, so the commitment to this three payoff uh, or to this outcome is very difficult for player B. Well, okay, but what about commitment to this outcome? Uh, well, I mean, as a player A, I definitely have incentive to commit to this outcome because initially I'm getting one, you're getting zero, right? We should be committing, but that's the problem. Player A, this time, is not going to commit to this payoff because if she chooses 3-1, one, 
I'm sorry, if she chooses D, she's gonna get three. But if player A chooses R, and if they really commit, and if they follow through, she knows that she's gonna end up pay off two, right? So again, there is a very attractive alternative for player A this time. And so commitment to this is also a problem. So in this game, so it's very simple. This is a game. These are the available actions. What should be the outcome? Uh, but in real life, there are a lot of um, ways to commit to a something, right? So for example, sort of giving a promise. You give a promise. I mean, the most serious commitment is writing a, a contract. So you write a contract with your landlord uh, promising that you're going to pay your rent regularly every month. Um, obviously, you have incentive not to pay that rent and instead, you know, spend that money on your vacation. Uh, but you have a serious and legal commitment, right? So you have a binding agreement. So if you don't um, follow that action, uh, well, you're going to be financially penalized. Um, so here there is no such thing because if there was, it would be part of the game. Because it is not a part of this game, as you can see, that's the game. So it means there is no uh, external commitment device. And, and also this is a non-cooperative game, so they cannot really um, verbally or officially or non-officially write a contract with each other. All right. Um, so everybody is trying to maximize his or her uh, own surplus. Um, and so that basically eliminates the commitment, uh, any commitment tool. So as a result of this, uh, I'm going to apply the backward induction in a moment. They will never ever end up getting a high payoff such as three, three, two, four. And this is actually payoff one for player A and zero for player B. That's going to be the um, backward induction solution of this game. So how do we find the backward induction solution? Start from the last period, last stage. So if player B ever, so if the game ever comes to this point, player B, um, she's not going to go for R because uh, R is going to bring her three payoff. She will go for B. So let's put arrow here. That's going to be the optimal choice for her. Knowing this, player A, she now knows if, if the game ever comes to this point, these are rational player and they can actually make very sophisticated you know, several steps of thinking. Um, so rationality is a strong assumption in many environments because unfortunately people do not make sort of uh, higher order thinking. It's like, what's going to happen if I do this rather than that? It's like, so, okay. So um, player A knowing that player B is going to go for D. So player A is going to end up pay off two if she chooses R. But if she chooses D, she's going to get three. So therefore, she's going to go for D, all right? And knowing that player B, if the game ever comes to this point, she knows that if she chooses R, she is going to end up with a payoff one because player A will choose D to get three. So one versus two. If player B plays D, however, she's going to get something more than that. Not as high as four, maybe, but you know what? It's better than getting one because my I know my opponent. Uh, so my opponent has a commitment problem. And so she's going to go for D. So you know what? I should go for small D. And similarly, at the end, I mean, not at the end, at the beginning, uh, when player A thinks about this game, she says, well, you know what? I can, I can, I, I think of committing to R, but the thing is later it's going to be impossible for me to follow that commitment. And also my opponent is not going to follow that commitment because we're going to be tempted. And so therefore I should choose D rather than, so if I don't choose D, but go for R, my opponent will end the game and hence as a player A, I'm going to get payoff zero. So you know what? I should end the game now instead and get payoff one rather than zero. So that means, therefore, the outcome, the, the backward induction outcome, backward induction outcome is unique, which is uh, player 
A ends the game um, at the beginning of the game. At the beginning of the game. And therefore, the payoff is going to be 1 for player A, 0 for player B. All right? Well, uh, again, as I said, in reality, commitment is part of the reality. People are not uh, that selfish. But how do we model, for example, commitment in this scenario? Again, it's like you can complicate the game and allow the players to write contracts. It's like, uh, let's play uh, R and R uh, till the end. If somebody deviates, whatever payoff you get, there's going to be a penalty. So the one party is going to pay something to the other party. If you don't pay that, uh, we're going to take court or I, I don't know, we're going to, we're going to, you know, terminate the, whatever, so the big punishment. And so it's going to be scary for them to be tempted. All right. So that could be one way of uh, forcing uh, each other to commit to an outcome. Or um, sometimes in economics, we follow that. I have uh, papers about the, with that approach. It's like, um, it could be that you, you think your opponent is just an honest guy, all right? I mean, he was born as an honest guy for some reason, religious reason, ethical reason, cultural, whatever the reason is. My opponent, she is an honest person. So I know with some probability, she's going to commit to that thing. All right. So it's, it's not a rational thing. I know, but she's not a rational person. All right. So she's, she's just honest. She's, she's not tempted. So I put some uh, probability that she's going to commit to that. So if that probability is high enough, well, then committing could be high enough, uh, sort of profitable for me, sufficiently profitable for me than being tempted. And so then we may support commitment. But normally, normally, I mean, under normal circumstances where with our standard assumptions, like players are trying to maximize their own payoffs and there is no um, uh, exogenous commitment device. It's like there is no side payment to each other or there is no, you know, uncertainty about their types. Um, so if, if there's no exogenous reasons uh, for commitment, so as a result of this, those rational and selfish guys uh, are expected to basically play, uh, you know, uh, in such a way that it ends the game at the beginning. At least this is what the backward induction uh, solution is. Uh, if you introduce some commitment devices like side payments, punishment, uh, exogenous beliefs about your opponents. Again, we can use the backward induction in those games, but those commitment devices or exogenous beliefs about your opponent's type is going to change the game. So it's going to become a, a different game. All right. Um, so in this particular game, that's the backward induction solution. I hope that was uh, a little confusing, but uh, mostly clear.